press that microphone, or is that already? Uh, yeah, if you want to go up there. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently currently on. It's currently on. Oh wait. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently currently on. Okay, I can hear myself. Currently on. I can hear myself. Oh wait. Okay, I can hear myself. Really? I can hear myself. Oh, uh, well, it's definitely picking up here. Oh, that's the other you're worried about. There's another one that's going to hit the road. Ah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's definitely ah, that way. Picking up here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it closer to my face? Or? Yeah, maybe. Thank <laughs> you. 
And give me a few extra minutes for people to show up. So are you familiar with the story behind the hashtag win? No. I just saw it over there. I was oh. curious. Well, I, I'm, I was guessing that that was number win, because it sounds a little bit like number one, but just me guessing. How do I get a JS Chicago like sticker like that? Um, I any? probably made this one. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just I, I had a I had a bunch of like st uh, printable sticker paper and sure. filled in some stickers. I, didn't I didn't know if you guys have. had one or not for like an official. Uh, know, like, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't really have we haven't really like done any like direct group sponsorship uh, that like pay for that. Right. And I'm not too big of a sticker person. Me neither. <laughs> I need more room on my right, using some ones for things like, you know, like if I, I presented at the event or yeah. no, really involved. Right. So how long have you been involved with this meeting? I think I started coming down here circa 2010. Okay. Uh, it was probably a little while before I noticed that the JavaScript meetups were not happening regularly. Yeah. <laughs> and offered to help.
Well, give another two before we start? Uh, yeah, I was going to give it a few extra minutes. Yep. Keep anyone shut up. Well, it'll make it look like more people if we have them all close in. Yeah, actually, <laughs> it's always one that I try and encourage, but then I remember people that don't. They usually sit where they want it. Yeah. They're like, oh, you're streaming this. We're just going to go back home now. And <laughs> Wait a minute. You didn't tell me you were going to stream before we started, did you? Because <laughs> they're watching on phones in the sunny part. Mm. <laughs> At which point, okay, do that. We Are you totally seriously? encourage it, but for the love of God, don't say you're attending. <laughs> Are you going to record this and all that? Uh, well, on? this is, uh, I happen to have Twitch available. Uh, they'll do, they keep VODs around for some number of days. Okay. And we could probably export them if we really want to. Find some place more permanent. Anything you like. Who, who's your uh, second speaker? Uh, the original speaker canceled. The JS guy. So, um, MD is filling in. Hmm? John Carr? Hmm? Was it John Carr? Yeah. Yeah. He, 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 I'm not sure which name he's using at the moment. It's still John Carr. Okay. Today, yeah. But that is the right one, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Wait, what? There's, he uses a different name? Well, I, I always knew him by his, by his meetup name, which is MD Khan. Yeah. And, and, and lately, thought. emails have been coming from Jankar, so. <laughs> Just check. I needed to revalidate my assumptions. So, mm -hmm. people, if you call me Dave, it's totally fine. Up there, it says David. Okay. Just to avoid any future confusion. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I uh, had a guy working for me uh, named Michael. Hey, Mike. It's Michael. I've been called all sorts of things. So. I just don't care. You see all shithead. I'll be like, hey, what's up? Can you uh, kick it off? Uh, I usually... All right. I'll uh, do the adult with that after. Someone's just going to let me know when to start, right? I'll just point right at Mike is live. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Scott, to the Chicago JavaScript Meetup. I'm Justin Love, if you don't know. And then... My co-organizer is somewhere. Uh, yeah, he's easy speaking tonight, so. Uh, welcome, thanks for coming out. Uh, did everybody get something to eat and drink? Yes? Uh, it's all provided by Enova, and the space, let's give them a hand. And uh, hi, I'm just an over here. Uh, happy to host. Um, just want to make sure we all know where the exits are. They're there, there, and there. Feel the way out. Uh, food there, beer at the end, pop around the corner. Uh, any questions, we've got staff with the Nova shirts on, uh, or me without one. But nonetheless, I uh, hope everyone enjoys the presentation. And uh, thanks so much for coming. And we're on to David, I believe, now. David? Uh, <laughs> not David. Back to Justin. <laughs> Yeah, uh, just, just one other little thing, I decided to try a totally crazy experiment today, and uh, actually I, I borrowed uh, the Innova camera. Happy to help. <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm actually attempting to stream this, and then there will be a VOD later. If there's interest, I could maybe see about exporting that somewhere else. I have no idea if the audio here is going to look good. That's why we're trying it as an experiment. And now, on to David. Thank you, guys. Hello, Chicago. Hello, JavaScript Meetup. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, exits are that way, <laughs> and beer is that way. So that's really hard for us. Uh, uh, so today, I was going to talk to you guys about um, TypeScript, JavaScript Reimagined. Um, just a real quick show of hands. Who's heard of TypeScript? Who's used TypeScript? Who's curious about that? I was going to say, if you're not, why are you curious about that? Um, right. well, I have to do like dual things here. It's a microphone. i got to carry around and use this little thing. So uh, it's going to be entertaining. So for the agenda, we're going to do an introduction. You're going to get to know who I am, where I come from, a uh, brief background. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the what, the why, and the how of TypeScript. And at any point during this, if you have like a question um, and I don't see you, I'm just like wave your hand. You know, we can make this like a conversation. Um, if, if you have any, you know, feel free to interrupt or yell or throw something. Uh, so my name is David Pine. If you are on Twitter, please follow me uh, and uh, watch for random stuff about technology. Uh, I'm active.
exclusively blogging at davidkline.net. Uh, I have um, open source GitHub. You guys familiar with GitHub? You guys do that in Chicago? Whoa. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I'm from Milwaukee, so I drove down here and I was a little frustrated with the Chicago traffic. So, and I spoke at an earlier uh, Chicago Coder conference earlier today, so I'm a little tired. Uh, but yes, so cool, you guys do GitHub. So this is where you can find me. You'll find all my source code up there. Stack Overflow, is that a website you guys heard of? Yeah, okay. So about a year and a half ago, I set forth with uh, a personal goal to try to give back to the community uh, in all various walks. So like with blogging, uh, mentoring, doing open source stuff. And then I was like, well, why not give back to Stack Overflow, right? Because every time I have a problem, I Google it, and Stack Overflow is like, you're an idiot, this is the answer. I'm like, oh yeah, thanks. So. I, I set out with a goal to try to answer one question a day. And who wants to say whether or not I made that goal happen? Just show of hands. Yes. Yeah? No? No! It's so hard. My God, Stack Overflow is like impossible. But um, I've been doing it for like a year and a half now. I've built up a decent reputation, and as a result of that, I'm actually in the top 5% uh, percent for contributing to TypeScript, Angular, C Sharp, Async Waves. A couple other things. So it's been really, really gratifying to be back in that regard. And then this is LinkedIn. If you guys want to hire me, I'm up in Milwaukee, so it probably won't work out, but there it is. All right, so what? So what is, what is that, right? What is this? What are we really talking about? So, first things first, since this is JavaScript Meetup, I want you guys to know that I love and I embrace JavaScript. Um, so we need to just have a you know, like a brief history here of you know JavaScript, like where, where we came from and how we're moving towards, and a lot of people are starting to embrace TypeScript. So JavaScript first appeared on May 23rd, 1995. Right? The dynamic untyped and interpreted language. You guys know why I did the quotes? Because it's really compiled, right? Took some time and stuff. Um, it's actually named ECMAScript. You guys ever call it that? Pretty sure this is Chicago JavaScript Meetup, not ECMAScript Meetup. That'd be kind of interesting if it was. Uh, it's the world's third most common programming language. So SQL and Java. I don't know why Java. So JavaScript was actually developed in 10 days by Brandon Ike. Um, that explains a lot. <laughs> And feel free to throw stuff at me if I offend anyone. Um, so the JavaScript was intended for 100 to 1,000 lines of code. So now with regularity, applications are 100,000 to 1 million lines of code. And I'm certain that that's even low. I was in any code in March, and I talked to some Plural site author who's huge on you know Node.js and all this stuff, and he was talking about one of his clients that has 84 million lines of JavaScript code. I was like, wow, that's a lot. So, yeah, so JavaScript really wasn't designed to scale, right? Initially, back in the 90s, it was designed with this little intent of kind of just sprinkling JavaScript throughout your application as you needed it, right? To handle certain click events and do something, right? But HTML at its root was just for documentation, just to serve up documents, and then involved in to what it is today. So enter TypeScript. Uh, TypeScript was introduced in October 1st, 2012. So it's 2017, need I remind you, this isn't really a new thing. It's, you know, people are still kind of skeptical and there's still a ton of introductory talks about it because it's hard for people to embrace. Um, it was created by Microsoft, so that's probably one of the reasons. Like, what is Microsoft doing with JavaScript, right? What is this, who is this guy? So Anders uh, Hausberg, has anyone heard of this man? No? He's like a super duper genius. So he was working at Borland on um, you know, Turbo, Turbo Pascal and Delphi, you know, these, these elaborate uh, advanced uh, programming languages. And Microsoft said, we want you to leave Portland and come to us. And they offered him $500,000 as a signing bonus. 
And Borland came back and had a counter offer. And then Microsoft's like, okay, it's, we're going to give you a million dollars. And then he agreed to leave Borland, and now he's been working at Microsoft. He's actually the lead architect on C Sharp and the inventor uh, and like primary developer for TypeScript. So uh, TypeScript, JavaScript that scales. It's a, it's a type superset of JavaScript that compiles to JavaScript. TypeScript files have, obviously, just a TS extension. So it's super exciting when you have a JS file and you change the name to TS, right? Backwards compatibility all the way up to ECMAScript 3. It's any browser, any host, any OS, it's modern, open source, um, all, these, all these great things that we'll kind of go into more detail. So let's, let's do a demo. You guys like live coding? Yeah. Talking about slides? Yeah? <laughs> it makes you anxious? Okay. Should I be anxious? All right. So I'm going to spin up Visual Studio Code. Anyone using this? Anyone like this? A couple people? Sure. Um, so I have a simple JavaScript file. And main.js, we've got this sort by name. It takes an argument of A. We invoke a splice. We get a result. And then we sort it using a, a simple sort function. And then we return the result. Right. So simply sorting by name, anticipating that the name property is going to exist. So one thing that exists with JavaScript today, this is totally valid JavaScript. However, sort by name can take an argument, a zero, or an empty array, or an object, or null, or a function, or undefined. And when will you know about that? If you're not using like a lint. The answer, too late. <laughs> you won't know until your, your JavaScript is requested from a client that's halfway around the world, and they pull that file down, and then it gets compiled, and then it tries running, and it's going to be a console log in their browser, and you're never going to know about it. Right? So, enter um, TypeScript. So, I'm simply going to walk through this file. I'm going to change the extension to TypeScript, or TS. And lo and behold, we have a TypeScript file. Nothing overly magical, right? So, what if we were to start? adding some things here, like types. So imagine that we have an interface for a person, and that person has a name, and that property, remember, is a string. Right? And we can add other things like age, give them a number. Likewise, we can do one, two. Well, actually, two. So instead of saying A, A is a great JavaScript name, by the way, because it's meaningful. Sarcasm, of course. You can applaud the sarcasm in the lab. Um, a is defined as any, but A is probably intended to be an array, right? Because you can call splice on an array. So what if we declare this as a person array? Immediately, our IDE is intelligent enough to then recognize that we have errors. And this is where TypeScript is beneficial. First of all, we know that uh, a person uh, has a name property on it. So when we invoke slice, we know that slice exists as an array. So if we hover over that, we see that array of person has a slice function. And as a result of that, the resulting thing is going to be an array of uh, people or persons, right? We invoke sort, and x and y is, of course, uh, a person and another person, and that name property is a string. So then why is this not working? Well, again, it was perfectly valid JavaScript. However, what we're really looking for is name.locale, not local. Okay. So a simple typo would have completely broke this entire function. And if it was just pure JavaScript, you would not have known about that. Right? So if we change that 
we add the E here. Now it's locale compare. That's a valid valid call. Likewise, with TypeScript, you can use later features that are uh, supported for what you're targeting as your output JavaScript. So we can use like the data arrow operator, for example. And what happens is, in addition to that, the functions that we had here that we were invoking with incorrect parameters, our IDE is now telling us are incorrect. Right? So the only valid thing at this point in time are these three. An empty array, a null, which we're not handling in better code, and undefined, which we can see probably in here. So you're probably asking, well, how does this actually, what's this actually look like, this, the output um, TypeScript? So output from TypeScript files are JavaScript files. Likewise, any JavaScript file is actually valid TypeScript. So let's open up the console here. I'm just going to run TypeScript init. And this will give me a configuration file within this directory. And then I'm going to run TypeScript compile. And it's going to compile and give us the output JavaScript. So one thing that you're going to notice immediately is that this JavaScript file looks essentially identical to the way it did before. So let's split this real quick. So here's our TypeScript, right? Notice how we use the fat arrow over here. It actually compiles, or transpiles rather, back to the function-based um, convention, right? So then it's following by default, we can look here in the config, in config uh, ES5, we can change this to ES3, or, or whatever you're trying to target. So the, the benefit is, the TypeScript, you can utilize the latest and greatest of the ECMAScript standards with a rich IDE and then com and transpile your TypeScript back to wherever it's compatible, you know, whatever compatible ECMAScript standard you're targeting. Any questions with that? Let me show you this real quick too. So if we define type, um, we can say type people, right, equals person array. A lot of times this is preferred, de decorating things with, you know, type aliases. This is a type alias. So we can say that this uh, object here, it, uh, A, is actually a person array, even though it's people. So what we're doing is we're declaring within the TypeScript ecosystem, inside the IDE itself, we're declaring a people type that is equivalent to the person array type, which is equivalent to an array of these JavaScript objects with these known JavaScript properties, right? Does that make sense? So the neat thing about it is once it compiles, and when you type things like that, you actually get rid of the other error. When that compiles, Let's just run that over here again. One thing that you're going to notice, there is no interface. There is no type. In JavaScript, those don't exist. Those are only within your IDE at build time. And those are just essentially training wheels for developers who are not JavaScript group, uh, like gurus that just remember every single API that exists out there. It doesn't accidentally type. Any questions about this a little bit? So, why? Why? Why TypeScript? You guys hear me okay, by the way? I just realized I'm not hearing the microphone around. I'm kind of facing. You guys can hear me still good or no? Is that not hysterical? Come on, guys. <laughs> um, so there's, there's lots of reasons why I believe that we should be using TypeScript today. I've been using it for roughly three years on enterprise applications with uh, Angular and Angular 2, and it's just been life-changing about my opinion as it pertains to JavaScript. So the future 
gap is one of the things I like to highlight as a whole. Um, you guys familiar with this term, feature gap, a little bit? So state of art, the state of the art of JavaScript, you know, and this is dated a little bit, but at one point in time it was imagined uh, ES 2015. And on the server, on the you know, node, it was only compatible at ES5, right? So, and then the web, it was somewhere before that. You didn't know kind of what browsers supported what TechniScript standard, and things got dicey in terms of knowing what functionality you can use in your code. And as a developer, I don't know about you guys, but I love using the latest and greatest. Like I, as a technical evangelist, that's what I live by. I just love it. I don't know why. It's like it's like a new car, right? It's like who doesn't want a new car? I want a new car. Um, so this is the target, and this is productivity, and this is referred to as the JavaScript, uh, the JavaScript feature gap. Whereas you have all these latest and greatest features that you want to use, however, you don't know what's actually compatible out in the world that you might be targeting. Therefore, you can't make that assumption, right? So assumptions are dangerous. And the problem with this gap is that people are like, well, aren't we ever going to catch up? No, the gap always exists. It just shifts, right? So you just keep transitioning through time where the script, uh, the standards are being developed faster and newer features are coming out faster and uh, browsers and other technologies uh, like you know, uh, server-side JavaScript, you just can't keep up with it. So TypeScript alleviates that wholeheartedly because literally you can be using the state-of-the-art JavaScript features in TypeScript and you can transpiling back to uh, whatever targets you desire, all the way back to ECMAScript features. So JavaScript, I like to refer to JavaScript as like the Wild West. You guys ever feel like that? Or I'm probably on the moon, okay. Some people are shaking their heads, all right. So when I was down at Code, I mentioned that Node.js guy, and we kind of had it out, because I like TypeScript, and he likes, he's, he's like a big time purist of JavaScript, and that's fine. Like I said, I love JavaScript, um, but I'm not like a JavaScript expert by any means, right? So I need training I I like having an IDE help me with things. So uh, I'm not gonna walk up to like Notepad++ and sling some C-sharp.net and feel confident about it. I'm gonna rely on Visual Studio and the tooling to tell me that it compiles the way I expect. So that's why I think of TypeScript as being like training wheels. And training wheels let you do cool stuff. Like when I was four or whatever, I couldn't do that. So, and the thing is here with not all champions, right? So the, the, the uh, Node.js guy was giving me a hard time and saying that, you know, you should really learn JavaScript. And I, I feel like I know JavaScript. Like I feel like I know JavaScript. But his point was that, well, we can't all be champions. We can't all be the people that write JavaScript, the good parts. And we can't all be um, like that JS guy. <laughs> so we're not all champions, right? So we might be able to rely on other things to help us with that. <laughs> so I, I have this like top five reasons, counting backwards, of the reasons that I believe TypeScript is, should be embraced. Um, so compatibility, as I mentioned before, it might sound like a broken record. JavaScript is standardized through ECMAScript. Unfortunately, not all browsers use uh, and use uh, support all uh, features of newer JavaScript standards. Uh, and there's this whole slew of different things, and these are all backwards compatible to ES3. Like the latest, literally the latest and greatest ES standards are part of the TypeScript compilation. They're working with the standards have TypeScript that ships the same day as the standard. So wrap your head around that. Like literally, they are revolutionizing the standard and they are working with them to make it part of the standard. So like whatever the standard is, there's going to be TypeScript that says, yep, we can do that and we can go back to the S3 and you guys are all great. So tooling. Uh, one of the cool things about TypeScript is when it was developed, it, it had a first class citizen of uh, this language service. So I've been showing off Visual Studio Code, and um, it works well, obviously, with Visual Studio as well, since it's coming from Microsoft. 
But because of the language service, it actually works in a whole slew of other IDEs. So just name, I want the crowd to just name some other IDEs real quick. What? The blind. Great. What another one? Yeah, another one. Yep. All, all these things. There's language services that are integrated that power the tooling for these IDEs that exist that are actually better than Visual Studio Code. This exists today. So with the tooling, you get documentation, statement completion, statement code completion, refactoring, and like I said, it's not just um, Visual Studio Code. You get all these things. Vim, who's a Vim person? Who knows how to get out of Vim? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I just usually read my um, Okay, Number three, open source. We talked about that. Thank you for the reference to GitHub and how I suck in Milwaukee for not being on GitHub earlier. Uh, uh, so basically, because TypeScript is open source, you leverage all of those benefits from um, GitHub, right? You can view the inner workings, the source code, you can post issues, you can actually become an open source contributor. Who's contributed today to open source projects that you use at your job? By a couple people, come on. I'm hoping there's more. Yeah? Great. Um, do you like open source? Double thumbs up. Great. Okay. So it's open source. So you can go contribute to it. You can propose features. You can work with these people. You can you can do it, right? So it's really, really cool that way. Uh, number two is static typing in a type system. So this is where a lot of debate is that people are like, oh, it's, you know, it's JavaScript, right? The JavaScript purists and all of us will say types don't make sense. Well, when you look at the tooling as a benefit and the IDs and how you work with I believe that this is what makes it powerful. This is what allows for all those things, like statement completion, refactoring, and so on and so forth. And actually being able to um, compile and, and know before you ship your code across halfway across the world that it works the way you expect. So with that, you get like basic types, advanced types. We're going to talk about some of those a little bit. Uh, classes, interface, and abstract classes, so you can actually work with JavaScript as it is as if it was like object oriented, you can have subclasses and stuff like that. You can work with inheritance, generic, types assertion, type guards, type alias, polymorphic this, lots of crazy, crazy things that you can do with this. Uh, number one, I mentioned this, so compilation. Like whenever I see a build error, it's like, oh, and dot that's like, oh, something went wrong, right? In TypeScript I see it like, yes, I just saved like a day of effort because now I know that one of my JavaScript that I was compiling is shipped halfway around the world. It's going to work the way I would intend. So it's not perfect, but compiling and seeing those errors up front is actually your friend. And it removes the training wheel, right? Because then you have to your JavaScript. Some peripheral reasons. So Angular, um, Google's Angular is actually written um, for TypeScript. So what's really, really funny about this, is you guys are all familiar with Angular. Right? JavaScript made up, assuming this is someone speaking your language, right? If you go out to angular.io today and you look at their documentation for how to use their framework, they're a JavaScript framework. They don't have their documentation showing it for support for JavaScript. They have it in TypeScript. And then you there's a drop down. It's like you want to do Angular with TypeScript or with JavaScript. And you said you change the JavaScript, and it's funny, they're like, we haven't done this yet. So, <laughs> grab your on that. So, the emergence of the SPA, like, you know, single page application, again, building tons and tons of JavaScript is, you know, on client side, huge applications. Um, it's not just like this little sprinkled thing anymore where JavaScript can, you know, handle a click here and change something, right? It's, these are really, really rich, feature rich um, applications, right? With, I like to talk about like RxJS. Uh, you guys familiar with that? Yeah, a little bit? It's an amazing thing. So uh, that wouldn't be possible without you know open source frameworks and um, something like a, a type system coming along and making it easy. So, and again, another peripheral benefit is familiarity. Like if you're familiar with JavaScript or C sharp, the syntax for TypeScript, I believe, is second nature. So David Fowler. This is an architect at Microsoft. He put TypeScript makes JavaScript so
so enjoyable. And I said, correction, TypeScript makes JavaScript tolerable. And this is where you guys might have to laugh. But um, and you guys probably won't, and that's fine. But to me, it's fun. Let's see if another example. So one thing I wanted to show you is really, really quick. Who's familiar with the, the notion of like a, uh, an enum? Okay. Uh, so in TypeScript, I want to show you this real quick. So up on TypeScript, lang.org, they have a playground. Part of that playground it actually shows you the side by side your input TypeScript and your corresponding outputting JavaScript, right? And let me know, should I zoom this in so let me see. Can you guys see this okay, or is it a little better? All right, so let's define an enum, day, of week, and this is where things get really cool. Uh, whoops, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Friday. So I'm not gonna type all those out. What I want to show you is how TypeScript is really reinventing what's possible. So in the type system with TypeScript, you can use the, the, the number value, the string value, and you get things like this. So whoever whoever is like this awesome JavaScript guru that thought of this stuff on the right, that's the output JavaScript. This is a reverse map. Within JavaScript, we all know that you can access properties via dots, the property name, or index, property name, right? This is a reverse map. So we are declaring on the left that enum, day of the week, we got Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, great. On the left, the JavaScript equivalent is bar, day of the week, function, day of the week, day of the week, with um, this expression here, return. So it also, so it's setting the string literal Sunday equivalent to zero. This zero actually returns and then saying property zero equals the string Sunday. So it's a reverse map. That's what humans are. I would never in a million years thought to implement this in JavaScript before TypeScript, right? Like who would have thought of that? Yeah, well, I just think it's pretty like cool. That's, that's pretty much, this is the entire part of this demo, I just wanted to show off something like that and how cool that is. So, do you guys think that's cool? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, moving on. So we talked about um, the, the what and the why, now we're gonna do how. Like how, how to type. So I mentioned basic types. We have uh, Boolean, true and false, very, very simple, very, very primitive types. We have numbers. We support all these different types, uh, you know, hex binary, decimal, octoliteral, whatever it is, it's all happy. Uh, strings, uh, obviously you can leverage the uh, templated syntax, right? Everyone's familiar with that, that's like yes, it's um, So, and then with basic types continues, you can do arrays, letting L equal the number of arrays where it's one, two, three. Uh, tuples, you guys use tuples? You guys familiar with the concept of tuples? Yeah. Question, do you guys say tuples or tuples? Mm. <laughs> tuples? Yeah, I think I've heard tuple. Anyone else say tuple? Usually it's like 50-50. People are like, mm. don't say it that way. So I say tuple. Um, so yeah, you can, you can do tuples. Uh, Enum that they showed off before. In addition to that, we have any. So any is going to be very, very familiar to uh, JavaScript people because any is kind of like the tooling doesn't know what it is. Like when we first showed that example of the sort by name that took a parameter of a, before we made that a TypeScript file, that was defined as any because it's like we don't know what this is. How would you know what it is? So that's a valid type. You can actually, within the TS config, you can specify to prohibit as part of your compilation, like implicit any, so that can you know, prevent potential mistakes like that where you have a bunch of people using any that they don't intend to implicit. 
This is where we start talking about advanced types. Now I need to ask the organizers real quick. It is 7.09, based on when we started, how much more time do I have? Hmm. Okay. Everyone using the rest of the time. function called extend and it takes generics. This is generic notation where we can say we're extending t and u where the first argument is a type of t and the second argument is a type of t. And this is basically an intersection type where it's saying the return type will be an intersection of these two types regardless of what they are. And it's an LSM, or it's, it's statement completion rich in that your ID will know that your new object that you have is both of those things. So you can access both of those as part of your um, IntelliSense. So basically it's doing very, very simple things where it's just mapping the properties or the members over rather, right? Iterating over both, saying it's got a property map it over great. So imagine we've got a collection of those things. Okay. So imagine we've got a class person with a constructor, a public name string, and we've got an interface of loggable with a function, an interface of loggable with a log void function. We have a class that implements that loggable, console logger that actually does nothing. So imagine we invoke that extend. We are invoking extend. Notice how the uh, IDE lights up and shows you what it's actually doing. So you have, an ex you're extending that where it's a person and a console logger and you're getting back the intersection of those two types that you can then use Freely as you as you you know just you know however you want. So I say I'm extending person David Fine with a new council logger. I get back David, and as part of that, I get this name property. See, the only thing that shows up is log and name. The two things that are available on those intersections. Is that not powerful? If I put something else here, like right, that's not going to work. <laughs> So, and the compiler will actually tell you about that, and the IDE will actually tell you about that. So then when we get into union types. <laughs> union types are where things get a little more uh, expressive. So, had left, we have a value of string, padding any, we're defining any as the type here. So we don't really know what it's gonna be. So we're gonna do some type uh, assertions. We're gonna say type of padding. If it's a number, we're gonna treat it this way. If it's padding to string, then we're going to treat it this way, or else we're going to throw an error because we don't really know what we're giving, right? So we can say, pad left, hello world for returns this string, right? So this passes at compile time, but this will fail at runtime because we declared that parameter as an any. 
So when we say true, since our source, our, our method is not handling that, it's not going to work when we try to actually execute. But TypeScript will say it's okay because that's how we wanted it, and that's how we wrote it. So imagine that we define a type string or number, where it is literally a string or number. So this is a union type. So now we can say things like union pad left with you know value of string padding that's either a string or a number. And then above, stuff up above won't, um, you know, we can use that same method body, if you will. And now we'll actually get a warning inside our uh, tooling that says this is not valid anymore, right? Because it's expecting either a string or a number type. We're just trying to pass in true, which is not a good deal. Okay? You guys with me so far? Cool. Uh, continuing on with that, we got an interface of bird that can fly and lay eggs. Fish also lay eggs, but they swim, so they don't fly, right? So what if we have a function get small pet that returns a union type of fish? Uh, or a bird, right? It's either of those. So we can say get small pet, pet lay eggs, that's okay. But this one errors out because they can't swim. But lay eggs is okay because we know that it's either of those two types define a lay eggs function. But they don't define, uh, one of them potentially doesn't define the swim. Right? So if we look at that, it actually will tell us that the property swim does not exist on the type bird or fish. The property swim does not exist on the type specifically bird. So it knows that this other one does actually satisfy that. Let me skip down a little bit here. Uh, 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 type zones. Okay. So uh, leveraging type of, you guys familiar with type of? Is that available in the app? Yep. Mm -hmm. Just making sure. So we can define functions like is number, give it x, any, say where x is a number and it's a type of uh, number, well, is string, right? So you can do things like string or number and then you can actually start leveraging some of that stuff before like you were doing. So it's not really super beneficial. It's just, you know, with primitive types like that, it might not be as powerful, but with more this gets to be a pretty neat feature. Skip down. All right, so type aliases. I talked about this briefly. So with type aliases, we can define anything we want as a new name via its alias and assign it to the type we want it to be. It can be an intersection type. It can be a union type. It can be all those different things, right? It can be a function pointer, so we either have a name or a name resolver, which is a function that returns a string, right? And then we can have a name or resolver that is a name or a name resolver. And then if we take that as an argument, we can see if it's type of string, and then we simply return it, otherwise return the expression evaluating the execution that would give us the string. Does that make sense? One neat thing is that if the, the, the tooling is smart enough to know that at this point, n is only one thing. n can only possibly be one thing at this point in the code. So it's smart enough to kind of look at what's there and say, at this point in time, because this is true above, this is the only thing that this can be. So above here, it knows this is a string, and down here, n is a function that returns a string. Pretty cool. You can get into um, generic. So uh, type aliases support interfaces. Uh, aliases can be generic. So we can say we've got a type of container of T where it's equal to a just random object that has a property value that is equivalent to T. So that's just a container. Or we can have a type of tree that is T that has a value of T with the left tree and right tree and then you can get crazy all kinds of stuff, right? You can have, uh, mix that together with intersection types. We can have a type that's a linked list of T, where it's T and a next of linked list. 
So you can start doing very, very powerful things within your tooling that allow you to say, we've got a linked list of persons, and that, that person is either a person and uh, a next person any, right? So then we can just say, name, next name, next, next name, next, next, next name. You can create these really elaborate objects and your tooling will support that wholeheartedly. Um, another thing is string literals. As part of that, you can define type aliases that are equivalent to string literals, right? So we have this easing. The only valid cases here are the string literals that match. If we try putting in something else, the IDE will actually yell at us and say, this is not a valid easing um, because you declared it as these three things. So if I, and this is not just localized here. This is if we have TypeScript definition files that exist, um, and we're saying that we are this type. Um, no matter what, if we say easing, and easing is defined as these three things and these three things only, no matter where it's coming from, the IDE knows that. So we can't just put stuff like hello, because it knows that type hello is not um, comparable to this type easing. Okay? And there's a lot more examples. This is actually all up on GitHub. Since time is short, I'm going to continue with the slide deck. But it gets a lot more elaborate and a lot cooler. You can do just a ton of amazing things with this type system. And I encourage you to hit me up after this. I'll, I'll show you some more stuff. So file extensions, um, I'm not going to explain this too much, but we've got TypeScript, we've got definition files, and JavaScript, obviously, we'll go back to the end. Map files. Map files come around since CoffeeScript. It's basically the way to map your transpilation stuff, you know, for example, .coffee or .ps, maps over to your uh, .java file, right? Uh, adoption. So one thing to mention is back in October 2015, there was only 500,000 downloads per month of TypeScript. Now, March 2017 is over 4 million downloads per month. So TypeScript is taking off very, very dramatically, and I'm on the bandwagon for the too. Uh, and with that, thank you, thank you so much. All right, let's start equipping the equipment, and you can continue doing Q&A. All right, thanks. Any questions, guys? Come on. Yes. Um, how about this? Into the That's a great question. So the question was, how does TypeScript know about other standard things? For example, like an array dot slice. Well, with TypeScript, you get a TypeScript uh, lib file that comes as part of your uh, TypeScript install. And for all the various bits that you are, uh, so, so say like uh, I, I install Visual Studio Code and I install NPM install uh, WAC G uh, PSC, you know, type, or even TypeScript, right? It brings down basically uh, a type definition for all these standard types. There's like roughly 30, over 30,000 APIs or something like that that are all well known and documented um, as part of JavaScript that are part of what we get with TypeScript. So it knows all those primitives. So the way that works is um, there's since your types are actually defined when you make a like when you publicize um, your TypeScript packages, for example, you end up with a dot d dot ts, which is your type definition file, and that's what the ID, like that language service I talked about, that's what actually uses uh, that file to determine your types, all your surface area. So there is actually, for basically 95% of all major JavaScript, um, like the Lodash, for example, all those things that exist out there have type definitions already. There's been a huge movement. There's um, an open source repository called Definitely Typed. And within that, it's just literally people running the TypeScript executable to generate the type system for that. 
And those types definitely will drive all the information. Anything else? Yes. I do not. Why? Uh, anything else? Before I started, like um, our scheduled speaker was uh, another person, and unfortunately she wasn't able to be present today. So last night at maybe around 5 p.m. I knew that I would be talking today. So if you need a few more beer to fill the time, feel free, and it's free for uh, to take from over there. And I will be talking about ES6. It's uh, about the same topic, but since I'm a different person, we have a, like a different approach. But we'll be mostly talking about some ES6 and some stories of my day-to-day -day life. So first starts with this one. And how many of you think that ES6 is uh, a sugar coat or something synthetical uh, sugar on top of ES5? Anybody think about that? The camera isn't directed towards you, so you'll not be... <laughs> uh, feel free to raise your hand. Okay, nobody. And so, anybody think that anything that uh, can be done in ES6 but cannot be anything brand new that you cannot compile to ES5? Is there any feature in ES6? How many people are here? Okay, let's answer this question. Okay, I see two, three people is here. Okay, a few more. Rest of you? Maybe in Twitter or Reddit or Facebook somewhere. So enjoy your life over there. That's okay. So first simple question is like, say I have this variable. Is it big enough? Okay. I have this problem a lot. Oh my goodness. Two variables. And uh, some point of time in my code, I want to know uh, that value of these two for debugging purpose. And I do console log. Uh, maybe x and y and when i see the output i always wonder which one is x which one is y do you guys have same problem anybody face this problem okay one person raise his hand you nod their head so i have a similar problem so uh, the another way i solve it is like this one maybe this guy and that tells me okay first one is x second one is y but there are like little better way to solve this problem is like say for example ES6 a simple easier way to work say for example if I have a variable name and the value is dude and if I want to create an object from this so I do say like var object and then usually I do name and then give the value that taken from the variable okay and that works so if I just log this, I will see an object with a property name and the value to it. And ES6 makes it little easier. So if I do object one, I if the name uh, of uh, the property is same as the variable name, so I don't have to type it twice. If I just do it, it will create an object with property name and value to it. If I had like X and Y before, I want to create a variable uh, object, 
say object two, and I want to create with multiple properties, say like x and y. In that case, I had variable x equals to two before and y equals to three. And if I create an object like this, and it will create an object with x equals to three, y equals to five. Okay. Uh, after all this story, we'll go back to the console log. And whenever I add x and y, and I, I see the output in the console, and I was concerned which one is what, other than typing all these things, if I just put a curly braces around there, now what it will do? Anybody? Any guess? It will nod its head. It looks like some people. <laughs> So what it will do, it will actually create the object just we saw before. So it becomes much easier for me to debug that uh, I don't have to like type the variable and the name in front of the, maybe I say like it is the first place, it's the second place, a lot of text. So it becomes easier to use the console log. So that's I use a lot every day. Another one from ES6 feature I use every day is if I have an array, for example, I have an array grades and my grades wasn't that good maybe i was getting these three marks and i want to copy this one to an another array so yeah, because i don't want to show my actual grades to my parents so i will have a, like a grade for parent so that will be <laughs> different so if i do uh, just assign the value grades here then what it will do it will do a reference for example if I do that and if I just uh, increase my grades for my parent for the first one to look it lucrative so if I do the 80 now my grades for parent changes as well as my grades also change the actual grades also change I don't want that so to do the copy sometimes we use some framework like underscore or low dash or jQuery this kind of way and we can do it in an easier way. So what we can do, another way, we can just use something in ES6 is called three dot. And what it does, it spreads uh, items of an array. And you can use it for a lot of different cases. I would be showing you the 10 different things I can do with three dots in ES6. So first go back to the grades, put some number, those things. And if I want to copy this array to an another array without keeping the reference to each other. So that if I change the one, it doesn't update another one. So grades for parent would be new array with three space, three dot. If I do that, in that case, my grades for parent is this. And even if I change one, say like zero is equals to 85, and my grades doesn't change. So you can easily copy an array into another array by using this three dot. There are like few other uh, use cases we would be seeing. And before that, uh, let's talk uh, one, two other smaller thing that could be useful. That is, if you want to, like I have a variable before, x equals to two, and another one, y equals to five, and if I want to switch this variable, say I don't want x to be 2, I want x to be 5 and y to be 2. What I do, as CS101, I create a temp variable. And in this temp variable, I put maybe x. And then I put x equals to y. And then sorry, y equals to x. And then x equals to temp. No, I put x there and then x equals to y and then y equals to 10. So if I do that, then my x become 5 and y become 2. So it switches. I have to create a, like a temp variable. So ES6 has a simple way. You don't have to do all these things. You can just do x and y and you just to do y and x and in that case your x becomes 5 
y become 2. So we will, this might look a little unfamiliar quickly because we will talk about this a little later. I just want to show that it's syntax as well as its productivity so that like if you want to do something, you can, it looks good and you can quickly do this part of thing. And uh, another thing I've been talking about, say for example, I will go back to the grades I had. Uh, these are the grades I had and if I want to know which the highest grade I got. So I can do, I, I, I know there is a like a map dot max and there if I pass few number, it will tell me the highest number, which is good. Now if I want to pass the array grades to this map dot max, it will not work as I expect this one to work. It will give not a number. And there is a workaround in ES5, and which is math.max, and we can do apply. And you have to understand maybe call, apply, little bit about bind. Everybody takes the first parameter. You can pass anything now. And then if you pass grade, there are like so many things you have to know to make this working. And then it will tell you that highest number in your array grade is 66. And if you remember the three dot, if you put a three dot in front of an array, it spreads the element. So it unbox the elements from the array and then it spreads it. So if we want to use like math.max and just three dot and grades. If we pass this, so this three dot will take out the elements and then spread all together and then you will get the highest number. So if you compare the one line one top and the bottom, the readability and the understanding increases significantly. And not only that, uh, you can do uh, like simple stuff. For example, if you have like uh, multiple arrays, so for example, you have good guys, an array, maybe few number one, two, three, and then you have bad guys. Maybe they are more powerful, five, six, this thing. And now, if you want to add all the elements in bad guys to add the good guys, that means like you take some black money and make it white, like if you are a millionaire. That's number one trick. If you want to be a millionaire, get a lot of black money, make those a white money through some processing. Or you can use JavaScript for that. So our goal is to take some array and put inside an array. What we can do, one thing we can do, we can loop through the second array and then push one element at a time. That works and that will take a little longer time. What we can do, we can take like good guys and we can use push and then we just spread the bad guys. In that case, it will uplift everything inside bad guys to an element and if you know that push not only takes one element, you can push like four, five, six, seven elements at the same time too. So it will lift every element from the array and then insert it inside this. And if you go to good guys, it will have all the elements. So very simple trick. If you want to take a lot of elements inside an array, just use three dots. Even if you want to create a new array, they all guys. And you want to say maybe your good guys, three spare. And then you put anything in between, maybe 12, 13, 45, whatever, and then you want to take all the elements in the bad guys. You can do that. So if you are creating a brand new array with maybe in desired location of all the elements, sum of array, all the elements of another array, you can do this, and then it will create the array. You see the first three elements from good guys, and then bad guys, and then in between the elements. So you can use it whenever needed. And another useful thing is uh, to use whenever you have the use case of like uh, inside a function. So for example, if I have a function here, say like this ABC and it takes some of the elements here. And you can use to get all the parameter, you can use arguments here. But arguments has a problem because arguments is not an array, but it is array-like object. So if you try to use map 
or for each or anything on arguments, it will throw an exception. And what you can do, you can create array of the, all the parameters to this function. You can just do like three dot and say like params. In that case, if you console log, you will get you will get an array and you can do map or anything. Not only that, you can do something like say, okay, I will take the first parameter as an A, second parameter as a variable B, and whatever left will go to the params object. And you can easily do that. So I will just call ABC with few more. And you will see uh, first A, first parameter I passed went to A variable, second one go to B, and we since we are console logging params, the rest of the parameters, sometimes this is called others. So others get inserted here. So now if you want to manipulate it, uh, anything, or sometimes you have a case like, okay, this is first parameter, second parameter, and then configuration object. Or a lot of people can be passed those as a, like a one parameter adding, adding. You can capture it here very easily. You can do few other. I will show you one extra simple thing. So if I have uh, an array here, and then one, two, three, I have a lot of values. And if I want to take out the duplicate values, an easy way I can do, say like bug k is equals to, I can use spread this guy with new something called set, and then I will pass array. If I do that, my clean array will not have any duplicate. If I have any duplicate there in the first time, so I will create some duplicate to prove it that it's working. You had before? Oh, okay, good. Okay, so he approved it. So there are a few, uh, few things you can do with the spread thing. And uh, I will talk about a little bit about a story right now uh, about my life coming to Chicago. Uh, so this would be something, the title of the story is Lost Love Story or Love Lost Story, something like that. So I was in high school like any other kid and uh, what always happen is like, you know, you start making friend first because if you want to make someone very special, you start with friend. So I had a greetings and I was always giving as a like a friend so that nobody else can think that was happening. And if I do console log greetings and everybody outside knows that that person is my friend, nothing special is happening. And especially I don't want to inform family members in the beginning, right? They can do anything. So I have another variable is family around. If that is false, then I will tell this person something special. So I have this if and is family around inside this block. So I thought like, okay, I will have another greetings and that this is very special secret, maybe Hadi, Badi, something like this would be there. And that would be a special condition. Only family is not around. So this condition would be is equals to false. And then I would have some console log outside and my secret thing, other people should not know, something like this. But unfortunately, it didn't help me. My secret things get exposed Bunny, which was supposed to be secret. So it caused a lot of trouble. People other knew, parents was mad, why you are not concentrating on study, why you are like uh, doing extra stuff. So that was the first problem. Then I worked hard, worked hard and find out some secret and that was something like this, where it's kind of like a letter that you put other persons inside their book or maybe some other envelope that other people doesn't know. So I found out that and I did the letter and whatever I can talk inside the letter, it was secret. And if I do outside console log, nobody knew that was happening. They were getting okay, undefined. 
the slider is not, there's a reference error. So this iffy was saving me my relationship, which was good, but secret is not like all the relations. So I would be like going here and there, and I had some kind of like seeing maybe five times in a week. So I have this variable, I less than maybe five, and then I plus plus, and we have like like everybody we have like some kind of conversations and mostly she liked cats so i have to talk like a cat so that was say like maybe not one meow meow multiple times as long as i need to convince or sometimes i said okay i am a cat so that it makes her happier and inside this i was doing console log conversations i so this was going good and people somehow knew that how many times I was going to meet her. So even it was inside the loop, people knew that the five times I went there and I will change this loop variable since I have like three text, three times. So my conversation was getting towards and also people knew how many times I was having conversation there. So that's what was happening when I was high school. I came back to Chicago, get a good job, and since I'm in a good job, I was busy with job because my boss gave me a lot of work. So what I did, I set some free message so that on her birthday, a special thing will go. On her our anniversary or something, this will go. So I set something like set time out, and I did some pre processing with this guy, and then I said, okay, every after a certain period of time, this should go to her every second for this reason. So I'll have the set, set time out. And then it was happened that she wasn't getting any of my messages. She was only getting undefined. That's why our relationship is like in a moment of like breakout. And that made me sad. So I was sad. I was uh, in the Chicago in a weekend, 4th of July, four days. And she is not responding. So I was sitting next to the lake and then some light came from the lake and said, okay, I'm the god of lit. So I uh, then gave me the lit and said, okay, do just one thing. Whenever you see bar, replace with lit. That's what I found with lit. So this was my problem. She wasn't getting my message. So I see like, okay, I have bar here. I change this to lit. What happens? Then if I do this, now it looks like she is getting my message. My relationship is coming in fresh mode. So what actually happened here? As, as, much, as long as I put let, let is a block scope. Block means it is available inside this block. And the way set timeout does, it stays in the block and create a block variable and that is always available to this function. And that's why the value of i it stays there inside that block and every time it creates a block in the JavaScript and she was getting my message. Not only that, whenever I have this, this one here, and if I put let here, the value outside of I will not go because block means whatever in between two curly braces. So I have a curly braces starting here and ending here. So if I put value of I, it will work inside it, but it will throw an exception outside because it doesn't leak. It doesn't go outside, and then you will not find those. I maybe I have to like reload this to make this working uh, because previously I had a variable I declared. Uh, I didn't refresh it, but now since I refreshed, I doesn't exist outside. So this also same and same way it will save me whenever it happens like uh, this case. If I have these greetings, and if I put a let here, and if I put another let, it will give me an exception. Uh, anyway, it, it will give me an exception unless this was uh, Mm -hmm. 
the idea here is that if you have something like uh, one variable, greetings is like letter, and if you declare another variable, greeting is ABC, it will give you an exception so that you don't declare two variables with the same name. And this letting has a strict mom, and that strict mom is called constant. That constant, if you declare once, this like pi or whatever, you cannot change the value of this. So if you try to set this pi to something else, 2.3, it will throw an exception. So ES6 come up with two things. One is let, another is constant, and let kind of completely replaces var. And constant is like whenever you want one variable and that doesn't change at all, you set it to constant. So if you use ES6, you will not likely use like var anymore. So this was like first part of, um, of the talk. And now I will introduce myself. Who am I? All right? It's a good chance to talk. So since um, Dave told he has a Twitter, I do have one too. Uh, though this is my Twitter. So if you find like jsdude005, uh, because this is my fifth year in Chicago, that's why I put like 005. And whatever I post, if you want to do a startup, I'm starting a startup. So recently I'm posting videos, my weekly blog that how you, when you should quit your job and start your own startup and how you get the ideas, how you register your business, how you do the marketing, all these things. Uh, I have only one guy like my video. That means it's not that bad video at all. So that's one thing. Another problem I see in the Chicago areas is like you will see a lot of special meetup like React or Angular meetup. They starts with the beginners level, and then if you have a sick day or something, you can't come to this meetup. They go to higher level concepts. Even in JavaScript meetup too, sometimes we do the beginners level. A lot of time we focus as on higher level, and I don't see a lot of a meetup that focuses for the beginners or intermediate level developers who wants to go to the next level. That's why I have a groundbreaking idea to start this meetup, Chicago front-end developers. So it would be mostly focused on uh, beginners technology. And uh, we have a next meetup coming on July 11th, exactly this place, so you don't have any chance to get lost in the street. And the first one would be getting started with React and some fundamentals. And how many people are uh, want to learn React? Few. OK. So this would be nice if you can come to that meetup. We'll talk about the beginners level. And uh, you have even better opportunity. That means if you want to learn React in a one day and build an application yourself, uh, because every time you plan to work on React, something else come up. Maybe your partner wants to go for shopping. That is anniversary. That is, okay, we have to see the fireworks. So we have to go there and those kind of things. And sometimes you may be like confused because there are so many content in the internet, but there is no directed path unless you spend, I don't know, uh, something. So that's why I have another groundbreaking idea to hands-on workshop one day, and you will get the link from there. Uh, exclusive React training, that's coming on July 15. And this is uh, 150. And this price gives you 100% money back guarantee. So if you don't like the workshop, you can ask for money back even after seven days of the day of workshop. So if you, if you don't like the workshop on the day, you can ask for 100% money back even day after until seven days of the workshop. So there is no risk. And on top of that, last thing, I'm giving a free coupon, Chicago. If you put Chicago, tonight you will get $20 off. Enough marketing. <laughs> OK. <laughs> sure. So that's all about me. Now we'll go back to ES6 again. So ES6, uh, we talked about five things. We talked about how you can do um, shorthand, how you do the three dots, and how you can use latent bar. Now I will talk about arrow function. 
arrow function is like a lot of people or I, including me, I have thought that uh, is just make your syntax easier. So whatever I thought was like same, if I have a function square and I just want to take a variable and then multiply it by or make it square, that's simple other than typing function and then return and all these things. And there are like few other variation and it makes it better one, two, three, and if you do map, you can just X. That's how you can make this uh, square of this your array. It's very simple, but it's not all about syntax uh, or the sugar you added. It helps you a lot. For example, uh, there is a use case before say if we do a like a object person and that inside this I have this dot age and in that I have something like this set interval and maybe every minute or every second I want to increase this dot age by one and then do a console log this dot age and I want to do it like in every second if I do this So I have to put inside a function. Uh, but anyway, so the idea was like previously this wasn't working. So what we used to do, we used to do is like create a variable cell and then cell b is equal to this. And then we were adding the uh, cell dot a equals to zero. And then inside this, we are used to like referring to the self dot a so that it's getting the reference inside the set interval. With arrow function, you can, you don't have to do all these things, you can just refer to this inside arrow function. So this will help you to uh, use arrow function. It also take over the, this outside of its context and put that context inside the function. So inside set time interval, uh, it will take out the context of the person and inject it here. There are a few other things I will not uh, go through and that is like proxies, one new thing. And then say like map, uh, weak map, those kind of thing. I will quickly talk about the modules. Modules is very useful in ES6 and it's using, you can uh, use it currently. And what it does, if you have a function or a variable, you just use export keyword in front of this. And that case, from that separate file, this function would be exported towards where you call this uh, file. And there you can do import from that file. And while you are importing, you can do multiple things. If you have like a lot of things there, you can give an alias, they like B as in boss or something like that. And from some destination of your file source. And if you are loading it from a node modules, you don't have to refer, you just maybe put like Angular. If you are doing your, in your file system, you will do some path location and you don't have to put like .js, those kind of thing. Another important thing in ES6 is a generator and iterator. What iterator does, iterator makes your object iterable, that means you can call one after another. And what generator does, generators gives you like an execution you can do, say this one, you put a star and maybe make ID. And inside this, you will do maybe bar index. less than five or something like that. In that case, other than return, you will do yield. And yield index plus plus. And if you do this, now you do like say maybe generator make ID. And every time you call gen, you will have something called next. And then it will add a value. And then you see like value is increasing. 
and it will have one thing is called like done, whether the execution is done. And this is very useful, for example, in some cases, you have um, local server running. If you save something, then the process will run. And when it's done, it will stop again. Those kind of things, it becomes very useful. Last thing I would like to talk is like async await. Async await makes your code look a little better. For example, oh, I see, okay, you are about to go home. Oh, I see, okay. Async await, you can use it maybe in the TypeScript too, but it's coming to the browser already, it's inside it Chrome. And uh, I will quickly show you some code. Here is like, say, if you see a if you see the promise here, sometimes it becomes a little bit harder. Okay, sure. So now I lost my point. Okay, that's good enough. So this one is the promise. So you have something and you use then and you see like a catch. If something error happens, it will return this guy. And it does the code works perfectly. And we are familiar with the promise or fetch API for a long time, but it looks a little bit weird. So async await makes it little better looking. So you put a async in front of the function and you write it like as a synchronous code. So you have like a wait and it will wait until this guy is done. And then if error happens, it will wait this. So if you look at the code, it looks like some synchronous code and it becomes maybe uh, more easier for you to run. And there are like few more things you can do uh, async await, and if you want to know, Jake has a really good article here, and you can spend one hour in your weekend if you want to go through it, but this is really useful. So that's all I want to uh, cover, and uh, maybe the third person asking a question would be ask that how can I get a slide or something like this token. So fortunately, a few years back, I have a ES6 stock, and that has most of it. And if you go to this one, that was two years ago, but uh, you would be able to get the tips and tricks while I talked, as well as few of them has in this document. Now, if you want free beer, you can join Dave in the corner, or you have any question we can talk or if you and it's time to for you break the sleep and go home you can stay here all night <laughs> no way you can't you can't stay here all night but if <laughs> yes uh, approved and but if you have, want to have food you can have food yeah. that is still there well not quite that severe, but no not all <laughs> Or if you have an uh, unlimited number of questions for him, you can keep asking, asking, asking. Uh, he's lying again. This is <laughs> uh, were, were there any questions for me? Okay. Good. Cool. Thank you.